Ah! Behind the Bastards podcast, bad people tell you all about them. Welcome back to our epic four-parter on the Vrinti Beria, everybody's second favorite Georgian who went on to commit crimes against humanity. Yeah, that seems even the people right. of Georgia's second favorite. Yeah, yeah, definitely the people <laughs> of Georgia's second favorite. <laughs> he is he is not quite winning against uh, against our buddy Stalin. But who is winning today is our guest in this fine podcast, Joe Kasabian. Joe, welcome to the pro. Graham. Hey, thanks for it. I'm happy to be the second Joe mentioned so far mm-hmm. in this episode. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good to be back. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to want to become like the unquestioned head of the USSR, you're going to need a pithier last name than Kasabian. It's just not going to sell. I mean, just like Joseph Stalin had to change yeah. his last name, I'm yeah. going to have to change mine. Have you considered a different alloy? Joe Tungsten? That could work. You know, I'm more of like a, a man of aluminum type guy, you know, <laughs> depending on the year that could be very valuable, Useful, but not not all that reliable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of useful, but not all that reliable. <laughs> let's get back to the story of Lavrinti Beria. When we left off our buddy, he had kind of finally worked his way into Stalin's good books. He had succeeded Yezov, the man that everybody called a homicidal dwarf, the, despite the fact that he was five feet tall, which is a like <laughs> a normal human height. I think it's we like can when say everybody says like Napoleon was short. He was just normal sized. It's more yeah. fun to think of evil people as short because then they're yeah. you know kind of adorable and innocent. Yeah, as opposed to someone with millions of people's blood on their hands. I don't know why it, we think it makes it better, but I guess people did. But anyway, Not sure. Yezov is out. He's going to be killed pretty soon after this because he's a guy who lost his job as a secret policeman in the Soviet Union. And that's what happens when you're a secret policeman. Yeah, you know, severance packages are normally, you know, I don't know how much a... a, mm-hmm. a uh, toker of bullet costs, yeah. but it's worth about that much money. Yeah, the, the severance packages are measured in millimeters. Apply to back of head. Yeah, um, and that's more or less what happens to Yezov. So, so by kind of the late 1930s, 37 or so, Beria is 38, like late 1938. Beria is the head of the NKVD. He's gotten close to Stalin by. <laughs> Becoming his mom's nurse and then attending his mom's funeral in lieu of Joseph Stalin, which is great. Stalin, at least two biographers I've read say Stalin always felt bad about this. I don't know that I believe Stalin felt bad about things. Maybe he did. I don't think Stalin ever felt bad about anything. Yeah, perhaps. How could he? Maybe it's like a Darth Vader thing where he's like doing the big like cheesy no as he as he did. Did Stalin have a powered body armor that acted as a a, a, a life support system? I assume so. I, um, I, I, I it worked all the way until he collapsed into a pile of his own piss in his office. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So November of 1938, NKVD head Yezov had been forced to resign, citing his health and the strain of being overworked. Lavrenti Beria replaces him, and he does the normal thing you do when you take over for the secret police, which is purge all of the guys who had been loyal to the dude before you, right? Now, one of the things that happens whenever this goes on is that you wind up purging all of the people who had done the last round of purges, which which Beria does. And that's really kind of the safe move, right? You want the people who are really good at carrying out a purge out of there because, you know, that's not going to benefit you at all if they're sitting around with their finger on any triggers. Yeah, um, it's like any company, however, that has like a complete 100 percent turnover rate in three years. You got to yeah. start getting a little bit worried about where you like the only way to secure to make Make sure that you don't end up in a ditch is to put everybody else in a ditch. Yeah. I'm it's sure an Amazon.com really it. kind of situation. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. He, he does. I, I assume this is how every Amazon warehouse works, but with yeah. robots. And like an Amazon warehouse, his first job is to hound his predecessor's wife into suicide, which he does. Oh, of course. Um, Jesus she Christ. She winds up taking poison that is supplied by his old boss, Sergo, who has also been killed by this point's widow. So Sergo's wife is like, I know the plan. Like, look, your husband got fired. You, you should probably just take this poison. Um, I promise it's better stuff. what uh what it's better to eat this than what uh Lavrenti has planned for you otherwise. Yeah. It is 1938 in the Soviet Union. Things aren't going to get better anytime soon. <laughs> you, you really don't want to be around for the next like seven years. 
it's, it's all it's all bad uh you, yeah you know, maybe we should take our daily vitamin suicide pill yeah yeah just go ahead and take this you'll you'll miss out on some bad times <laughs> So the rate of arrests and executions does decline after late 1938, but not by as much as you'd think. Like people will generally agree this is the end of the the terror, but they're still executing quite a few people. And now it's Beria kind of doing the executions. Uh, three arrested Politburo members are killed in early 1939, and Beria handles those executions. But these prove to be the nadir of this particular level of fear, at least for high-ranking Soviet officials. The next thing Beria is going to do is follow in his former boss's footsteps, purging Red Army officers. And since all of the really good ones are gone, he's not even purging the top guys at this point, right? He's taking out random lieutenants who looked at him <laughs> yeah. wrong. There's one marshal here. He, he, right after he moves to Moscow to like take over the NKVD, he's going to wind up like torturing uh, Marshal Blucher. Uh, B l i u k h e r is how it's usually anglicized. And Beria, he's not great at tor- he's not as good at torturing as he's going to be. So he kind of accidentally beats this guy until he loses an eye and dies a few weeks later from his injuries. Um, we hate was, on the job injuries, you know. We, it's a bummer, you know. You're not supposed to torture them quite that much but what do you do when you've accidentally killed this guy too fast you torture his wife right uh sure that's what it says in my employee handbook right here (laughs) Yeah. yeah Yeah, that's that's the norm uh, for podcasters. And this Marshall's wife is later going to claim she felt that Beria tortured her just for sadistic curiosity, kind of because he had killed her husband too early. I don't know how well to judge that. He's got to get better yeah. at it. You, you know, he, he needs on the job. Training. You need 10,000 hours of torturing to get really good at it. That's what that Malcolm Gladwell book is about, if I'm remembering it properly. I, I think it might actually have been. <laughs> yeah, that book is torture. So I get it. Now, as the killing receded, a sense of cautious optimism emerged among the men of Stalin's inner circle, and Beria is now officially among them. At the 18th Party Congress in March of 1939, the gang was met with thunderous applause, and Stalin announced that the recent purges had made the USSR more resilient than ever in the face of ongoing fascist pressure. And again, this is the justification guys like Molotov are going to be parroting until literally 1980, that this great terror that kills all of the officers who know how to do anything in the army was necessary because you didn't want unreliable men around when this inevitable conflict with fascism starts out. Everybody knows the first step of every emergency is to take the nearest firearm and just shoot the tip of your own dick off. Yeah, yeah. Just you so don't the want enemy that dick can't. getting in the way. Yeah. <laughs> now they can't shoot you in the dick. You've already <laughs> suffered the worst that you can suffer. Exactly. That is kind of the logic they're working on here. It's one of those, you know, it's it's fair to say that Stalin at least always expresses that war with the Nazis is inevitable. And obviously Hitler believes that war with the Soviet Union is inevitable because he starts one. (laughs) Um, That said, not everybody is convinced that this is in fact the case. And kind of some of the evidence for this is that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany are kind of engaging in war games and joint training exercises through the mid 30s. And a much more direct threat to actual Soviet territorial integrity in the late 30s is the Empire of Japan. And they're actually going to wind up fighting the Empire of Japan well before they wind up in a direct conflict with the Nazis. Yeah, Mongolia, right? Yeah, yeah, over Mongolia. That's right. Um, Because, you know, the Japanese army has occupied Manchuria since 31, and they're kind of continually expanding through the 30s, which eventually locks them into a series of border conflicts with the Soviets. This kind of culminates in the Battle of Lake Kassan in 1938. That's kind of the, the really big engagement in this series of clashes. And then there's a series of kind of lower stakes battles until the calamitous battles of Kalkin Gol in Mongolia. Yeah, that, that one was real bad. Uh, it's like, really bad. Yes. <laughs> this, the, the Soviets built an entire uh, rail line just to get all of their supplies there while Japan made all their dudes march hundreds of miles on foot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, by the way, not easy to make the Russian army look efficient, but the Japanese manage yeah. it during this fight. It's a sizable battle for the time. By like World War II standards, this is like a skirmish, right? There's like tens of thousands of men and hundreds of tanks on each side, which does not make it hugely noteworthy within the conflict that's going to happen. But this is one of the first massive tank battles in history, right? And it's where Mm. Georgi Zhukov is going to earn his reputation. And Zhukov is going to be a big player in the war that's coming up, right? I think I've heard of him. 
Yeah, yeah, he, he's kind of noteworthy. Uh, the Japanese Sixth Army is defeated. And it's kind of clear to everybody that, like, the Empire of Japan is probably going to keep doing Empire of Japan stuff, right? So, again, within sort of the gang that's running the USSR at this point, there's a lot of concern about Hitler planning an invasion. But you could be forgiven for being like, well, maybe Japan's kind of the more immediate threat at this stage because and i mean not to they mention, are, it's not the right? first war that they fought there was the no. russo japanese war as well that's that was right disastrous yeah. yeah and this is kind of like you do have to look at also like if you're these guys who have overthrown and replaced the czar it's pretty good for them to be like well when we fought japan it went a hell of a lot better <laughs> yeah <laughs> we didn't lose the whole navy I mean, even at the end of world war ii <laughs> Uh, the Soviet Union would be uh, uh, retaking things that the Empire of yeah. Japan took during the Russo-Japanese War. So it was all yeah. like petty grievances 40 years later. Yeah, yeah. Now, and again, within kind of the gang of people around Stalin, there's still overall much more of a focus on Hitler, which is going to prove to be pretty wise in the long run. Although how they actually prepare for war with Hitler is not wise because they don't really prepare for war with Hitler, you know? Uh See, Robert, I disagree. They prepared plenty by murdering everyone who knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get, get rid Four of all those DHS. guys who know how to fight a war, except for yeah. Zhukov, thankfully, over in Mongolia. <laughs> um, now, there's a couple of different plans that they kind of have for how to play this. Stalin's first idea is to try and develop a situation wherein Britain and France invade Germany, and he just sort of chills, which, if that had worked, would have been a much better plan for the Soviet <laughs> Union, right? <laughs> Hard not to see why you would prefer that. Uh, now, since 1935, the general policy of the Soviet Union had been the popular front against fascism. And a lot of officials thought this meant that kind of inevitably we're going to wind up in some sort of alliance with Britain and France, right? Because they are clearly like, obviously, just based on World War One, not hard to see why you would expect that that's how things are going to break down, right? Right. But it's not going to wind up being that simple, as Sheila Fitzpatrick writes. When Britain put its negotiator on a slow boat to Leningrad in August 1939, Stalin and Molotov had had enough. Molotov was offended that the British had sent a foreign office official of the second class, William Strang, to negotiate. And Strang, like other Western diplomats who encountered him in his first months as a foreign minister, was struck by Molotov's lack of diplomatic technique as well as social finesse. He had no sense of negotiation. The British ambassador later recalled and would just stubbornly and woodenly repeat his own point of view and ask innumerable questions of his interlocutors and you know molotov because of the pact with the nazis that's going to come out of this i think has this kind of reputation for being a good negotiator he's certainly not at this point and again it's also not hard to see why his his immediate kind of reaction to the these western powers isn't going to be positive because these guys had been enemies of the ussr since the civil war right Right. Um, since before it's like settled as a state. So it's not really surprising that one of the things that's happening in this period, contrary to what's going to happen later, is there is some serious talk of allying with the Nazis. That is probably never, that's certainly never Stalin's plan, but it's something Molotov thinks actually might happen for a while. I mean, you also have to remember like during and after the Russian Civil War, yep. the British, the French, the Americans, and the Japanese yep. all were actively invading Russia. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this is not like, and also historically it's not weird, right? Otto right. von Bismarck had worked very hard to develop an alliance with the Russian Tsar because Bismarck, being reasonably intelligent, is like, well, if we have an alliance with the Russians, we just can't be invaded. Invaded. Like, you can't take Germany if Russia is backing it up. Like, it's just yeah. not really realistic, pretty, you know? It's safe. How do you fight that war, right? And obviously, like, the fucking Kaiser fucks all of that up, which is part of why World War I goes the way it does. Um, again, Stalin has never liked or trusted Hitler. He sees some sort of conflict, a war, as pretty inevitable. But there's definitely a period where even Stalin is like, we might have, we might be able to, like, temporarily have some sort of an accord with the Germans that will give us time to rebuild the Red Army, which I know I kind of fucked up, right? <laughs> and this is what leads to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which is, you know, one of the, like, three treaties everybody learns about in high school. Um, yeah. 
Now, the, the terms in broad are that neither state is going to attack the other uh, or help with someone else's attack on the other. Um, that's the public stuff in this pact. And this is a pretty major reversal from the popular front against fascism, obviously, right? You can't call this a popular front against fascism. Well, now um, it's the popular front with fascism. Yeah, because the, with you know, fascism. the secret agreements of like, you know, let's uh, yeah. I have this cake shaped like Poland. Um, yeah. How would you let's like see. to divvy it up a bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and we'll get to that there. But but the fact that there is this dissonance between the old popular front against fascism and this new pact, this is like severe enough that it causes some real issues within sort of the Soviet power structure. And it's these are serious enough that Stalin has to kind of take them seriously. And he actually sits down with a lot of his underlings to try to explain the necessity of the move. Beria's son would later claim that this never works on Beria and that he's privately unenthusiastic about the pact. I don't know how seriously to take that. <laughs> you know, the key word yeah. is certainly private. And was he really enthusiastic about anything other than murder? Yeah. yeah I mean, what I mean, hobbies murder, does Beria have? <laughs> marrying teenagers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Classic extra secret police guy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Beating people until they go blind. Yeah. Um, obviously, Beria knows that his new position in Moscow is still pretty shaky, and all the comfort that it brings him relies on continuing to suck up to Stalin. Uh, Khrushchev in this period describes Beria as constantly manipulative and always working to ingratiate himself with Stalin and provide dirt on his colleagues. Stalin, who does have kind of a sixth sense for when people are kind of getting too far up his ass, would regularly, whenever kind of Beria would get too close, would do something to try to remind him of his place. And we get a good example of this in September of 1939, when at a dinner, Beria kept pushing the German embassy counselor, Gustav Hilger, to drink to excess. Hilger later claimed, Stalin soon noticed that Beria and I were in dispute about something and asked across the table, what's the argument about? When I told him, he replied, well, if you don't want to drink, no one can force you. Not even the chief of the NKVD himself, I joked. Whereupon he answered, here at this table, even the chief of the NKVD has no more say than anyone else. <laughs> Which is bullshit. I, I just on assumed Stalin Stalin's was going to make him go it. visit his mom again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go see my mom again. Well, she's dead at this point. <laughs> Fuck um, off. Go hang out at her grave. I'm sick of yeah, you. Yeah, get out of here, Beria. <laughs> I mean, this is Beria is kind of doing to this Nazi what Stalin had him do to kind of the other guys in the Soviet power structure, which is he's kind of the dude at their dinners who's often pushing people to drink more, which Stalin likes to see. But Stalin doesn't get anything out of making this Nazi get hammered, right? He's still trying to keep good relations with them at this period. So he's kind of just like, Beria, what the fuck, man? Like he, he wants no, to get the Nazi really drunk so he can draw dicks on his face. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're gonna I watch would, cowboy would... movies. You're gonna pass out, and then you're gonna mm -hmm. wake up, and I'm gonna yeah. laugh really hard. Yeah, tomato in your pocket and a cock <laughs> on your cheek. So, however, I forgot he felt... about the tomato in the pocket. <laughs> it's so my favorite. It's strange. <laughs> it's hard not to like that part of Stalin, right? That's just such a fun little prank. It's something like a twelve-year-old boy would do. <laughs> Okay, I kind of did something similar when I was, I wasn't necessarily a kid. I was like 16, maybe 15, going to house parties, getting drunk. And one of my favorite things to do was like when one of my friends had like a, a dog or a cat or whatever is like mm -hmm. find where they had the cat or dog food and mm -hmm. then like slide my hand into people's pockets and deposit fistfuls of dog or cat food into their pockets without them <laughs> noticing. I have no idea I why I thought it was so funny. I think a lot of us have our like little little psychopathic thing we did to our friends when they were. I used to light my friend's pants on fire, you know, just a little <laughs> bit, not all that much, right? As a bit, you know, as a fun bit. Yeah, um, it's, it's not it's not bad if you're like, haha, no, I got you as your I fucking got you. I don't know, Jinko's yeah. jeans are going up in flames. Yeah. And if you can't have them executed for not laughing at the bit, right? I think that's key. That is um, the ultimate punchline. Yeah, <laughs> this throwing someone in a mass grave. <laughs> you will laugh or else. Yeah. So however Beria feels about this pact with the fascists, he presides over a purge of the People's Commissariat of Foreign Affairs to wipe out any diplomats who have a strong anti-German history. As soon as Stalin is like, we're, we're going to be friends with the Nazis for a little while, Barry is like, well, it's time to kill every diplomat who doesn't like the Nazis, right? That's going to be a problem when you just have, like, the coalition against fascism. Like, right. I was like, everybody in the diplomatic office like, wait, wait, I thought anti-fascism was our yeah. thing. God I'm sorry. damn it. Where are we on this? Yeah. 
And this is, I mean, the main purpose of this is not just to get rid of anti-Germans. It's it's largely an opportunity to take out any diplomats who are not totally committed to Stalin, right? Because a lot of there's a lot of diplomats in the foreign policy chunk of the USSR who are just like diplomats, right? And that's the thing that they actually wanted to do is like be a functional diplomats. And what's happening in this period is the NKVD is gaining what's going to be semi-permanent oversight over like the 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 actual foreign services, right? Beria is going to have men in there for most of the rest of the time that he's alive. And so that's kind of what they're doing in this period. And one of these guys, one of these anti-German diplomats is a dude named Litvinov who had supported forming an anti-German bloc with the West. Litvinov is one of the guys who's like, well, Stalin, you keep saying we're going to fight these Nazis. We should probably have a thing set up with the British and the French. That just yeah. seems like good business, you know? We probably need this um, on paper and not just vibes. Yeah, not just a vibe thing. And Barry is going to respond to that by having the NKVD surround Litvinov's house. And Litvinov, you get the feeling he's kind of like a cool customer because when he sees he's entirely surrounded by the secret police, he calls Beria on the phone and he's like, what the fuck are you doing? And Beria <laughs> responds, you just don't know your worth, man. I got to protect you. You're in danger, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I do seem it. to be yeah. in danger. That is correct. Yes, I, I will agree with you. This seems unsafe. <laughs> Now, another arrestee in this moment is a diplomat named Nazarov, who gets busted on charges of spying for Italy, not because he had actually spied for Italy, but based on the undeniable fact that he had been born in Genoa. And he'd been born in Genoa because his parents were longtime committed communist revolutionaries who had to flee after the revolution, right, in 1905, which is like really unfair to this guy. You know, your parents are like so committed to the cause that they have to go into exile. And then people are like, well, you're clearly an Italian spy. You're trying to steal evidence against you. He's trying you were... to steal our sauces for their goddamn pastas. <laughs> you were born in Genoa and yeah. you only eat pasta. Fuck. Yeah. You cannot be trusted. Uh, this passage from Amy Knight's book gives good context on how brutal some of these arrests tended to be and just the sheer level of like bullying that dominated them, right? Quote. Ganadin, who's one of these guys who gets arrested, recalls how he was taken to Beria's office after he had refused to confess to the espionage charges that Kobolov had accused him of. When he continued to deny the charges, Kobolov, who weighed more than 300 pounds, and his assistants began beating him on the skull as Beria sat complacently watching. Then Beria impatiently ordered Ganadin to lie on the floor, where he was kicked repeatedly by several prison employees. Ganadin had one final session with Beria, who at first adopted a thoughtful, cultured manner, asking Ganadin calmly if he had finally decided decided to confess. Again, when Ganadin steadfastly asserted his innocence, he was brutally beaten. Beria's last words to Ganadin were, with such a philosophy and such provocations, you only make your situation worse. Christ. Oh, what yeah. good would have been done to, like, even if they are innocent, most of the time I'm going to assume they're probably innocent. Yeah. It's like, okay, you got me. I'm guilty. I did all this shit. I don't, you're just going to die anyway. You might as well make yeah. it work for it. You know, you're, you're still going to kill me, but you're going to kill yeah. me tired. Yeah, I mean, that is often the decision people are making is like, well, if I admit it, it'll hopefully be over faster, right? Of course, but, of course. Some, some of reason my torture doesn't work as an things. interrogation tactic. Like, I'll yeah, tell you whatever exactly. you want as long as you stop pulling out my fucking fingernails. Yeah, and that's why I am kind of amazed by the few people it doesn't work on who are like, torture me all you want. The one thing I have is not giving in on this, you know? Um, and you do run into a couple of those guys. Not many of them, obviously, because most people... <laughs> for understandable reasons, don't hold up under that forever. But there are a couple. Um, anyway. Braver Beria than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least tougher. Beria was given a dacha on the outskirts of Moscow that had once belonged to the former chairman of the USSR, who'd been arrested in 38 and executed uh, that year. It was furnished by the same architect Stalin used, who was later sent to a gulag and killed in 39. Like most powerful men in the USSR, Beria's dacha had a movie theater. Svetlana, Stalin's daughter, claims that on Sundays at the dacha, Beria would relax by shooting at targets and then watching American and German films in the evening. Afterwards, he would disappear to, quote, no one knew where. We'll probably never know precisely how Beria spent his off hours, but the largest allegation you'll hear involves that he was committing rampant rape, often of children. Um, now, I was about to say, at any point, there's a long period of time where nobody can pinpoint Beria's location. 
It's I'm assuming not good. someone is suffering. Someone is someone is having the worst day of their life. And if you want to have the best day of your life, purchase these products. We're back, and and we're talking about Beria's extracurricular activities. Now, the fact that Beria is like a rampant sex criminal is often taken as a given by people discussing his life. It is worth hammering home that a lot of what's alleged about him comes from fellow members of the inner circle who, again, wanted to pin all of the blame for Stalin's excesses on Beria. This is in like 53 after Stalin dies. After his arrest, Beria's bodyguard is going to produce a list of 39 women who Beria was said to have had sex with. And this is presumably a mix of just actual consensual affairs and non sensual stuff. Another bodyguard made this allegation, summarized by Knight. Quote, Another bodyguard, Nadaria, confessed at his trial in 1955 that he and Sarsikov picked up young women off the streets and transported them to Beria's house, where he would rape them. According to another source, young women in Moscow came to be terrified just by a glimpse of Beria's pictures in the press. Stalin, who was a professed aesthetic in sexual matters, must have heard what Beria was up to, but apparently chose to ignore it. And again, uh, well, it's mean, really like, hard. Like, I don't doubt this, but it's also like you do have to keep the province in mind, which is other guys who are being tortured to confess. I, I 100% yeah. believe that there is truth to both sides of this. Or Barry mm-hmm. was absolutely a monster in his personal yeah. time as well, especially because, like, look where they kept finding skeletons, for example, right. um, as well as everybody making him seem like, you know, a hundred thousand times worse than he actually was, which is not a defense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, especially cause like Stalin when like totally knew when you like, I, like, I think we already talked about it. Was like he told his daughter to never go near Barry alone. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> he and did that for a reason. Yeah. And I, I don't think like the fact that Svetlana seemed to have always been aware that there was something unsafe about this guy is some of the best evidence we get. Right. Because I don't see why she would necessarily like why she would not have felt that way. Right. If there wasn't an actual danger. It does make me wonder when it when it started, because he's had a fair amount of power for quite a long time. And I highly doubt he waited until, you know, he's the head of the NKVD to flip a switch. Like, all right, now I'm going to do this for fun on my free time. Like there, there had to be something we just don't know about, you know? Yeah, I can see it being a situation where just like when he's earlier in his career, still in Georgia, there's just not enough good info left from that period of time that we have many of these stories because of how many people get purged, right? Right. And so it's when he gets to Moscow and there's more survivors from that time that we get these stories. That seems plausible to me. Yeah. One of the stories you'll hear from his bodyguards is that they were ordered to hand each of his victims a flower bouquet as the victim left Beria's house. And the implication was that this made it consensual. And if they refused the bouquet, they would be arrested and probably don't have to guess what would happen then. One of Beria's bodyguards, Sarkisov, reported that a woman who had been brought to Beria rejects the the flower bouquet and flees his office. And Sarkisov hands her the flowers anyway. And Beria's like... <laughs> No, it's not a bouquet now. It's a wreath, and may it rot on her grave. Christ. So, yeah. Again, I don't really have trouble believing this. I don't either. It seems yeah. to be his kind of his his thing. Yeah, it's 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 probably you know. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't have trouble believing it. And when you when you hear the same story from so many different sources, yeah, uh, it, it's it is convincing. And there's no reason, like, yeah, it, it makes sense that they would lie and try to make Barry look worse to cover their yeah. own asses. But it makes no sense from the lie and come up with inc- incredibly elaborate flower based murder reasons. Right. That you, that feels really specific. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's not something someone just pulls out of their ass. Like it, it would be very no. easy for them to lie and be like, yeah, he was a rapist and a murderer. Not yeah. suddenly he has a flower game involved. He has this flower based system. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Now, there are some folks who will say that this is all bupkis. You know, one former NKVD employee has stated he thinks it's unlikely Beria would have had time to do this because he had so much self-control and he was so busy. And Beria's wife says the same thing, which like, you know, and and maybe she's honestly saying this, like her claim is that like he was always working. Where would he have found the time to do this? And it's like, well, 
but he was very powerful and it would have been easy for him to lie to you about this. And, you know, and she would, ah. she would hardly be the first serial killers, right? Spouse. Exactly. Who had no idea did, that they were doing what they're doing. I mean, he was killing so many other people. Right. How would she even notice that she ki- that he killed 38 or so other people as like a side gig? Yeah, and that's kind of where I land is like, yeah, you can you can find people from the United States in the 70s who were married to someone who was committing like serial murders and didn't know it. I, I don't have trouble believing that the head of the NKVD could get away with a version of that. You know, yeah, like the Green River killer's wife had no idea that he was the Green yeah. River killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't need to actually think that she's trying to cover up something to think that like she's not right when she states that, you know, and I don't feel like Barry is the most open soul when it comes Probably to having not. deeping, meaningful conversations with their spouse. Yeah. I, I would not be surprised to hear that he was not great at communication with his, sort of <laughs> the, his relationship. Yeah. Probably um, a, a fair assessment, you know? Yeah. So anyway, this is a thing that is debated and it's kind of worth talking about the degree to which some of this is uncertain. Knight concludes the argument around it this way. Even if the stories circulating in Moscow were exaggerated, they almost certainly had some foundation. They were corroborated by Edward Ellis Smith, a young American diplomat who was serving in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow after the war. Smith noted that Beria's escapades were common knowledge among embassy personnel at the time because his house was on the same street as a residence for Americans, and those who lived there saw girls brought to Beria's house late at night in a limousine. So there you go. But like Knight says, I think it's almost certain that he was committing what we would consider to be a pretty huge number of sex crimes. That seems easy to to argue, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, like uh, a well-regarded um, journalist, yeah. Grover Fur would probably disagree. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So on November 30th, 1939, the USSR invaded Finland. This would prove to be not the best idea that ever happened out of the Stalinist (laughs) era, Um, largely because Finns are notably bullish on remaining Finns. This kind of goes badly. The USSR gets expelled from the League of Nations, although that's not really a huge loss for them. Uh, But they do suffer titanic casualties, which further contributes to the kind of collapse of the Red Army, which appeared so total in 1940 that Hitler grew convinced he only needed to kick in the door to cause the whole house to collapse. And obviously, Hitler is not accurate here. Um, but this, the Red Army's not looking good after the invasion of Finland. For uh, his part, so small plug here, my show, we did a, a series on the Winter War uh, a little yeah. while ago. Yeah. Yeah. Good one to listen to to figure out how Finland can hold off the Red Army and inflict what, like around a million casualties? Yeah, it didn't go great for the Soviets. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, don't piss off guys who are into butterflies. It turns out that ends badly. (laughs) For his part, Beria did crucial work on the Finnish front. Largely, he established the NKVD Ensemble of Song and Dance to ensure the young boys being sent to die to Finnish snipers had one last night of very (laughs) mid-entertainment. That is such a, imagine being sent to get shot to death by lepidopterists and your last relaxing experience is the NKVD song and dance unit. That sounds like the most depressed song and dance. Like what are, what is the, like the, the, the goth version of theater kids like that? That's the, the kind of energy I expect to be brought here. Yeah. Everybody's dancing. No smiles in any faces. They're, yeah, and their their uh, music listing all ska. Yeah. Oh, hey, now that would be a nice <laughs> last night if it's good ska. Bring some real big fish out there before you get murked on the finish front. You Nobody's know, said have it was a good nice ska. Time. Like their horn player barely knows how to play. Nobody's yeah. skanking. <laughs> They're just doing that fucking uh, mighty mighty Boston's album about the short George Floyd. <laughs> 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 oh, what a horrible time. <laughs> hey, look, um, there's a landmine. Pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> so Beria also spends a lot of time uh, fucking up his new position as the center of foreign affairs. Now that the NKVD is basically overseeing the foreign affairs office and watching over every diplomat's every move, Beria found the temptation to fuck with things too great to endure. As part of the German-Soviet pact, the Nazis sent a battle cruiser to Russia as payment for raw materials. Beria had his men try to entrap the Nazi naval officer who brought the ship. The goal was to turn him into a double agent but they were really bad about this and Hitler found out and complained to Stalin and Stalin's like 
what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, we we needed this boat. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Nobody yeah, Bar- told you to fuck with them this way. Barry is such a weirdo. <laughs> he can't even honeypot someone correctly. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, he's far too weird for that. So the Nazi-Soviet treaty was publicly just a non-aggression pact, but like any good treaty, it included a bunch of secret protocols. And these laid out how, when the Nazis carried out their invasion of Poland, the Red Army would be allowed to move into eastern Poland and some of the Baltic states, right? And this this doesn't happen kind of all at once. They move into Poland first. The Baltic states kind of stay independent on paper for a while, and the Red Army moves into the Baltic states. Um, but this process starts in September 1939. And when it does, Beria finds himself presiding over a vast number of captured Polish officers and soldiers, something like 200,000 men. Oh, right? no. That's never yeah. a good sign. No, no, you certainly don't want to be one of these Polish officers. Now, about also, half the- I don't think anybody loves a good protocol quite like mm. the Russian secret police at any given era of time. <laughs> so no. They're loving good protocols. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you uh, you don't want I, I mean, none of this is going to be a good situation. Now, about half these 200,000 guys are freed pretty quickly because holding prisoners is expensive and kind of a pain in the ass. You got to feed them and shit. You got to feed them. You got to take it's just the logistic problems. But this is going to quickly turn into a very ugly situation, as Timothy Snyder lays out in this passage from Bloodlands. Lavrenti Beria had come to a conclusion, perhaps inspired by Stalin. Beria made it clear in writing that he wanted the Polish prisoners of war dead. In a proposal to the Politburo, and thus really to Stalin, Beria wrote on 5th March 1940 that each of the Polish prisoners was just waiting to be released in order to enter actively into the battle against Soviet power. He claimed that counter-revolutionary organizations in the new Soviet territories were led by former officers. Unlike the claims about the Polish military organization a couple mil- of years before, this was no fan fantasy. The Soviet Union had occupied and annexed half of Poland, and some Poles were bound to resist. Perhaps 25,000 of them took part in some kind of resistance organization in 1940. True, these organizations were quickly penetrated by the NKVD, and most of these people arrested, but the opposition was real and demonstrable. Beria used the reality of Polish resistance to justify his proposal for the prisoners, quote, to apply to them the supreme punishment, shooting. So they take this chunk of Poland, a, a chunk, about a quarter of the, the people they initially take prisoner, engage in some kind of resistance activity, like you do when your home is invaded and occupied. Um, and Beria mm-hmm. uses the resistance that's there to justify shooting as many of these guys as we possibly can, right? Now, there's debate. Is this a thing that Beria proposes and Stalin rubber stamps? Is this a thing that Stalin made clear in a conversation like, Beria, I want you doing this? Um, and then Beria just carries it out. You get this kind of debate with a lot of the stuff that Beria does, right? Is I mean, this I have a, a hard thing time that- believing he's committing such a wide scale massacre without some kind of official approval. Certainly some kind of official approval, but I also Stalin's doing enough that I wouldn't be wildly surprised if it's Barry is saying, hey, I think this is a good idea. And Stalin going, yeah, man, let's fucking let, let's go for it. You know, that's I what I that pr- really... probably was much like there's yeah. no written order from Hitler to commit the Holocaust. Right. Did they, uh, right. It's like, yeah, go it's ahead. It's not really how the guy worked. You know, yeah. he's got a lot on his plate. Regardless, it is Beria who is in position and is going to take responsibility for the massacre of a great number of Polish captives. To do this, he had to revive the logic and tools of the Great Terror. A new Troika system was established to go through the files of every Polish POW. Most of these men had already been interrogated and generally shown to have been nothing but soldiers who had done their duty. Beria instructed the Troikas to ignore all previous conclusions and issue new verdicts. They would not actually need to interview any of these prisoners to do this, of course. As in the terror, Beria gave his men a quota. In all, 97% of the nearly 15,000 Poles in various camps were put to death, along with 6,000 Polish officers held in prisons and another 1,305 who were arrested in April of 1940. This was disguised until the last moment, with prisoners who were evacuated being told that they would be sent back to their homes. It's likely many of them realized something was fishy, but there was little to do but queue up for the buses and trains that eventually took them to a train station. Snyder continues, quote, There they found themselves 
disembarking from the train into a cordon of NKVD soldiers with bayonets fixed. About 30 of them at a time entered a bus, which took them to the Goat Hills at the edge of a forest called Caton. There, at an NKVD resort, they were searched and their valuables taken. One officer, Adam Solsky, had been keeping a diary up to this moment. They asked about my wedding ring. The prisoners were taken into a building on the complex where they were shot. Their bodies were then delivered probably by truck in batches of 30, to a mass grave that had been dug in the forest. This continued until all 4,410 prisoners sent from Kozelsk had been shot. The 6,000-some-odd Poles held in prisons in Belarus and Ukraine were executed indoors rather than in a field. Snyder tells one hideous story of an NKVD officer shooting the shit, just kind of bullshitting with an 18-year-old boy while he waited for the executions to start. He asked the kid, like, what was your job in the Polish army? The kid says, telephone operator. He's like, how long did you do it? The kid says, six months. And then he goes and shoots the kid in the back of the head. Christ. This kid and 6,313 other prisoners at least were handcuffed in a sound proof cell and shot in the base of the skull so this is like pretty bad stuff you know it's not good being no. uh, you know it's uh the the nkvd found him guilty of a uh, high crime in the soviet union which is being polish being a polish dude yeah yeah now, one of Beria's main triggermen is a guy named Vasily Blokin. Vasily had been an NKVD executioner during the terror, and he had done the deed on some of the highest ranking prisoners that were purged. Today, Blokin holds the official Guinness World Record for most prolific official executioner. I what checked a, on what this. What a high award. <laughs> what a high honor. And did, he, did he escape being purged himself? He, he does, I think, eventually get purged. You know, honestly, I don't have that on here. I probably should have. But I, what I do have on here, Joe, I found his official Guinness website page for his, <laughs> his world record. And boy, howdy, does the website design of, of the Guinness website seem inappropriate for hosting an article <laughs> about this guy? Check this shit out. So if he's got to put the most prolific <laughs> official ex- – they didn't even capitalize every the first letter in every word of that. Oh my god, what is this? <laughs> what is this fucking title? <laughs> it's like it's like most prolific official executioner above like an image that's just like a cut of like the tallest man in the world. Yeah, people like the biggest it's a really hair. bad Photoshop. A going lady on with here. long fingernails, a guy balancing a bike on his chin. And meanwhile, no picture of him. <laughs> what, what's it like? The, no. this, this arm, what is happening? Yeah, he, it's he's amazing. You've heard of the stinky leg, right? He's doing the stinky, <laughs> stinky arm. arm. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking incredible. This is one of those records that like Guinness wouldn't have up anymore for fear of someone attempting to break it. But it, like it this is, one, I think you know, I feel like we're safe on this one, guys. <laughs> you you note that Joe immediately after this pretty grotesque graphic comes the note: this record is currently inactive and no applications are being accepted for it. Well, isn't so, that wait, good oh, news, really? Guinness? <laughs> I'm but glad yeah. they closed this one. And here um, I thought uh, Jeremy Renner would finally beat mm-hmm. a Guinness World Record. We don't this know what he's doing his. in his spare time. This could have been his. Oh, God. That is sad, though, folks. I know it, someone at home has a dream to beat Vasily's record, and I am sorry, but the Guinness people have made up their minds. Some poor um, civil servant that works for the state of Texas immediately got <laughs> let down. There's a postal worker driving around listening to this show who's just like, ah, rats. <laughs> Damn it. I guess I have to go um, back said, to growing my fingernails now. It, it would not, if you're paying for your own bullets, this is not a cheap world record to meet because they estimate this guy's kill total at some 7,000 people. So you can't um, do that anymore these days. Bullets mm, are too expensive of woke. because of woke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting guy, uh, Vasily. He wears a leather cap, apron, and long gloves to keep clean. Uh, he uses German pistols. If you're going to mass execute people, you're going to want a German handgun, right? Um, so you certainly don't want a Russian one. Time. <laughs> no, you definitely <laughs> don't want a Russian one, right? You know, in 1911, probably would have been great for field executions, but I, I understand maybe they were hard to find. I'm guessing a Mauser, pretty reasonable gun to use for that at this period yeah, of time. Small caliber, less splatter, yeah. but he is wearing an yeah. apron. The man is well prepared. He has his merit badge in mm-hmm. preparedness. You have to assume he was good at this, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, otherwise he would have been fired after like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, a dozen. No, no, he keeps doing this. And he's during this this massacre of these Polish officers. He's in uh, just other soldiers. It's not all officers. He's going to execute about 250 men each night uh, personally, which is a lot. Uh, Yeah, that's a lot of dudes to shoot on your own. He's going to get a repetitive stress injury in his trigger finger. (laughs) He gets a fucking carpal tunnel. (laughs) 
He has to wear one of those little wrist uh, guard things before he goes to yeah. bed at night. Gets like whatever their purple heart is for repetitive stress injuries in the field of genocide. Yeah. <laughs> Christ, that's, that's that's good. That's nice. It's really sad that he probably survives World War Two, right? Like that's unfortunate. I think he. Well, yeah. You know what? I, I, I I'll, I'll edit that in here when I look it up. But first, Joe, you know what? I don't have to edit my love for these products and services. I'm really glad that your ad finally sold me. The proper wrist support I need for pulling the trigger hundreds of times. Yeah. yeah. Look, if you're going to be like Vasily Bloken, you need a wrist brace. It's just <laughs> irresponsible to kill 7,000 men without one. Are you uh, he a makes secret it to 53. Ex- oh, that motherfucker. <laughs> he makes it all yeah. the way to the end of Stalin. Yeah, he does. He does. He's forcibly retired after Stalin dies. He gets stripped of his rank during the de-Stalinization process by Khrushchev. And then it does seem like he dies maybe just as a result of being super unhealthy and sick. He kills himself officially. Um, His final execution is It may have been a heart attack. And yeah. Well, the only person who can kill me is me. The guy who knows how to do it the best. Yeah. I will say living to 60 when you're this guy is not bad. Yeah. I mean, it's bad because he's bad, but that's impressive for the guy who shoots 7,000 people. Yeah, normally, the death squad guy isn't the one that survives this long. No, no. That's a good span for the death sp- squad yeah, the, guy. The stars that burn the brightest burn the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so while all of these prisoners are still alive, Beria had allowed them to communicate with their families, like send letters back and forth, not out of humanity, but because, again, he's about to do another crime against humanity. He wants to collect the names and addresses of their family members. And after he executes all of these people, he takes the friends and family that they had been communicating with and he rounds them up and deports them to Kazakhstan. This winds up being something like 60 something thousand people. Um, Mm. And in 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 NKVD transport documents, they're described as family members of, quote, former people. Um, oh god I, mean, yeah, I believe this is bleak. around the same time the Soviets deport large numbers of uh, Chechens and uh-huh. Dagestanis to Kazakhstan a lot of deportations are happening right at this time right this is kind of the this is kind of like he's co- sort of breaking the seal on doing mass deportations and Beria is the mass deportation guy because he's good at logistics right like he's brutal a lot of people so. are dying during this but he's good at moving lots of people you know And again, I probably don't have to labor on the fact that this is a miserable situation for the people being deported. These evacuees, to use the Nazi term, were not properly cared for or fed. Uh, They were put to an unfamiliar land. They were separated from their homes and their support networks, and thousands of them die. Their situation is so bad that on May 20th, 1940, a group of these Polish children write Stalin a fawning letter, swearing, please, Stalin, we will be loyal communists, and then begging, it's hard to live without our fathers. So that's bleak. I really hope Beria doesn't read that, and he's like, okay, well, I'll send you Mm -hmm. to your fathers then. Because that is how Beria would read that letter. Yeah, it's probably good that he didn't get access to this. Um, Now, these NKVD executioners and the guys who manage the deportations, Beria does make sure they get a cash bonus, you know, because he's a good boss, at least. Um, uh, You had mentioned the other deportations. There's a lot of them. In March of 1940, Beria had ordered the deportation of any Poles who refused a Soviet passport, arguing that they had rejected the Soviet system. Now, there are good reasons to not want this passport, because this passport, and this passport system is pretty new at the time, lists your ethnicity. And that had been used to target members of national groups, right? The vast majority of people deported in this first wave of deportations are Jewish refugees who had fled to Eastern Poland from Western Poland, making the best choice they could at the time, which is like, well, the communists are probably better for us than the Nazis, right? And they are- that's that's a rough fucking choice to have to make. It's not- a lot. It's not like as much better as you'd hope, right? Um, because the Nazis are going to try to kill everybody, and Barry is just going to force all of these people further to the east, where a lot of them die, but not all of them, right? And the Soviet passport, by the way, never takes your ethnicity off of it the entire length of the Soviet no. Union. No, that is always a major thing. And it's going to be, there's also a lot of these guys who are like Western 
Polish Jews are like, well, we're not, we're refugees. We had to flee here to not die. But like, I'm not a Soviet citizen. I don't want to to be a Soviet citizen, right? I want to go back home at some point, <laughs> right. um, which is why they, you know, but that scene is like a sign that they're not reliable of disloyalty rather than a pretty normal response to the situation that they're in, mm-hmm. right? Um now that said, you know, at least a lot of these people do survive and maybe they wouldn't have probably wouldn't have if they'd stayed in Western Poland. Um, you know, so I don't know. I don't know where you want to like place that. It's a rough time. It's like trying to pick which kind of shit is the best or in the right. worst. Yeah. At least maybe you live through this kind of shit, you know? Um, now, at the same time, Barry is managing all these mass deportations. And they get much broader than this, right? Again, a lot of not too long from now, a lot of Chechens are going to be deported. Like this, this is a pretty widespread program. Um, Barry is also presiding over the vast expansion of the Gulag system. Now, Gulag is an acronym, and it stands for Main Administration of Corrective Labor Colonies. But you know, whatever that is in Russian, you know, I don't. I don't speak it. Uh, by March of 1940, as Beria expelled Jewish refugees from West Poland, the Gulag system included about 53 full camps, 425 corrective labor colonies, and 50 colonies for children. In total, I think something like 1.6 to 1.7 million people are interned. Everybody That's, knows those numbers that have like, a little flex, right? Every, yeah. Every, everybody knows like a good policy for any good empire is to have prison colonies for children. Yeah. That puts you on the right side of history, and there's no debating that. Yeah, why wouldn't you want camps just for little kids to be forcibly separated from their families? Yeah, their little fingers can get into machinery. Right, right, right. That you have, I mean, that is kind of where this goes, because like any oh, sort man. of large-scale labor camp program, these are largely an economic incentive, right? Of like course. that's why what the gulag system is in large degree. Now- some historians like Alex Nov will argue that you should include people in prisons and so-called NKVD special settlements as well in the number of people in gulags. If you do that, it brings the number of human beings incarcerated under Beria's nominal supervision to something like three and a half million by the outbreak of war. Again, it's debated God. how you should consider That's... this. One Soviet source puts the number at a still terrifying 2.3 million. That's this a is population a lot people, number you know? larger than several Soviet satellite countries. Yeah. Yeah, it's a significant amount of people are in various camps and prisons that Beria is running. And the gulags are not death camps, right? Most people who are interned there do survive. And that's important because it, these are not the same as what the Nazis are doing, but oh God, they are no. not good, right? <laughs> you know, no, something can still be shit not, and not be a death yeah. camp. Right, right. The goal is not to wholesale exterminate populations, but that's really the only nice thing you can say about them, right? A lot of people still die there. Um, between 34 and 53, probably about a million people die in gulags. This Jesus. is debated. It's not a small number, though, right? Um, I think but during also I the imagine worst... these numbers are quite unreliable. It's not like they're keeping track right. of how many people that died. Right, right. You're not going to get a precise count. And it the how deadly these places are varies based on what's happening in the rest of the USSR and with the war, right? During the the worst years of the Gulag system, some accounts will say like a 25% mortality rate, right? It was usually under 10%. Now, both of those are bad, right? <laughs> Neither of those is a good situation. I'm not trying to mitigate it, but it all it changes in terms of how deadly it is based on what else is going on, right? Right. Now, and again, when I say the purpose of these gulags is not to eliminate people, it's because the purpose is to profit from their labor. And you can really only do that if they're well enough to work, or at least if most of them are, right? And I'm going to continue with a quote from Amy Knight's book here. The most important economic activity of the NKVD was construction of roads, railways, waterways, and power stations. Some projects were undertaken directly by the NKVD and some by gulag workers contracted out to other commissariats. Mining of gold and non-ferrous metals and lumbering were other key areas of production for the gulag. To have such a vast economic enterprise under his control was an awesome responsibility for Beria, though he left the day-to-day administration to his lieutenants. According to most accounts, Beria's group was more effective in the utilization of camp labor than Yezov's had been. In an effort to raise productivity and more rationally exploit forced labor, Beria improved physical conditions in the camps and increased food supplies. As a result, camp death rates declined from what they were under Yezov, and forced labor became a more productive element of the national economy. So you could argue 
compared to how they had been under his predecessor, broadly speaking, gulags are less deadly and miserable under Beria. And this is pretty consistent with how he treats, for example, captured Nazi scientists, not out of the goodness of his heart, because he needs work from them, right? And it's he's like a rational he's good enough guy logistics. to know like, He's good at logistics. He's like, well, people who are starving to death don't work as well, and I want them to produce economic value for me, right? Right. Um, the you know, evil again, of arithmetic, uh, you know? Ex- exactly, exactly. And again, these are still not nice places. In 1941, an internal report showed that prisoners at the gulags lacked soap, water, clothing, and food, and were often made to work 12-hour shifts with regularity. You don't the need Germans soap and- if you're building roads for 16 hours. Right. Why would you need soap, you know? No need. Um, yeah. In October of 1941, nearly 1,500 people died at just two NKVD railway construction camps. Former Gulag prisoner Antov Antonov Ovyasenko later described Beria's influence on the Gulags this way. The Gulags existed before Beria, but he was the one who built them on a mass scale. He industrialized the Gulag system. Human life had no value for him. And, you know, well, I might add human sense. life didn't. Labor did. Um, but yeah, labor I don't and think output. you give him a lot of credit for that, life. right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course, of course. That's, yeah. that's the point. It's, like, it's not that he made the gulags more humane, as he made them more efficient. Right, he made them work better, you know? Because why wouldn't you in his situation? But you know what works really well, Joe? Oh, no. <laughs> you, as a podcast host and author, you want to tell people where they can find your work? Uh, yeah, I am the host of the Lines Up by Donkeys podcast. Uh, we talk about military history, disasters, and also occasionally assholes like Beria. We also did a series on the Winter War, and we did a series on the Battle of Stalingrad, and uh, several other things that are loosely connected to this topic. I'm also an author. Uh, I'm currently in the middle of writing a military science fiction trilogy, and you can find it anywhere you find your books. It's called The Undying Legion. Hell yeah. Check out the Undying Legion. Check out the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. And look, if you ever want to start a system of forced labor camps, I don't know, maybe have a sandwich instead. See if if fixing your blood sugar maybe makes you less want to run a series of labor camps. I I Um, thought I wanted to make a forced labor camp system. It turned out my blood sugar was just low. I was just kind of (laughs) hungry. Had some Fruit Loops. Feeling a lot better now, to be honest, guys. Ah, <laughs> uh, if only. Anyway, everybody, go to hell. I love you. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com. Or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.